So without graciousness in our lives, Christians are not necessarily very nice people. Because of our strictness to a certain kind of code of life, if we are not gracious, we actually appear to be hateful and full of what is now known as hate speech. So we need to be very careful. Sarah was maybe of that sort. She was the self-appointed arbiter of town morals in this small town. And she stuck her nose into everybody's business, told everybody where they were wrong. She happened to be mistaken, but she one day accused a neighbor called George of being an alcoholic. She accused him of being an alcoholic because she spotted his pickup truck parked in front of a bar one afternoon. And she said in front of her church folks, in front of him and the church folks, George, everyone who sees it there will know what you're doing. George didn't say anything. He just walked away quietly. Later that evening, he parked his pickup truck in front of Sarah's house, got out and walked home and left it there all night. <laughs> Do you really know what's going on in other people's lives? Harold and David were hunting when David suddenly fell to the ground, stopped breathing, uh, got checked, no pulse, didn't know what to do, pulled out his cell phone and blurted out uh, to the 911 operator, uh, my friend just dropped dead, what am I supposed to do? And she was a soothing operator, you know, they've been taught. And so tried to get him to calm down. Okay, okay, I can help you. Please just relax. First, let's make sure he's really dead. So he said, okay, and he gets real quiet and all of a sudden he hears two gunshots, boom, boom. And he comes back on breathless. He says, okay, uh, what do I do next? <laughs> Made sure. You see, without grace, we shoot our wounded. If we are saved, we're always totally saved by God's grace. We cannot add anything to it. We think we can't but we can't. It's not of works, else we would be able to on the day of judgment boast in front of everybody all the good things we did. Romans 11 and verse six says, if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer of grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. It's incompatible with the concept. Romans 11 and verse 32 says, God had committed all, that's all of us, to disobedience. He's let you become disobedient. You hear me? Every last one. That he might have mercy on all. Hmm. There's a message in the mercy he's showing us. We needed to fail. You can't learn graciousness without learning grace. You needed to fail. We are of such prideful nature that we start thinking we deserve things and we needed to learn to fail. Ephesians 2 verses 89 puts it this way, by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it's not of works, lest any should boast. There will be nobody in heaven saying, boy, I did a lot on earth, that's why I'm here. No, not a one of us. But if we are saved, we're always saved, and we're totally saved. It's also true, if we are saved, we are never totally saved. And that's by God's grace. Now follow with me. You see, God never gives up on us and is forever saving us and sanctifying every part of us. There's parts of us that aren't saved yet. They're lost. Those parts of our heart, those parts of our life, that we haven't fixed yet, have we? They're still just as bad as they were before. We're still dealing with it. You know, so none of my family followed Jesus when I was a kid. I mean, we were heathens. I don't, I don't mean to make heathens have a bad name, but it's true. And, and by His grace, He saved us, and all of us ended up giving our lives to Christ through the church. Uh, but then, 
in our zeal to grow, basically my entire family became Pharisees. You know, we became hardline and judgmental, straining at gnats and swallowing camels. I know I got a degree in it. I could show you my degree. God sought us out by his grace still. And now every last one of us have softened in my family. That's amazing to me. I could tell you more about that, but I'll leave it right there. First Chronicles 28, 9. The Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But he's going to work on you to get there. If you think you've arrived, you're mistaken. 2 Peter 3, verse 18. But go, grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We need to grow in that. It's not the easiest thing to do. We tend to not want to do that. But we need to grow in that grace, in the knowledge. You know, when we first believe, here's what I believe is happens. At least it happened with me. When we first become a Christian, we want to be better people. Good thing, right? So it's what I found is it's a lot easier to change this than it is to change this. So we spend a lot of time programming this and what we believe. And so we focus on what we believe in our doctrine and getting it perfectly correct. Because that's easy. I can just say all I got to do is learn something. I don't have to change anything. I'm already at church. I already repented, confessed, was baptized. But it's hard to change this. So because I change this, I think I've arrived. And I become more and more a Pharisee. But then there comes a time when I realize I'm not doing everything. And then that has to change. Because I realize it's got something else at work. It's called grace. And now I've got to quit being a Pharisee and I've got to become a better person. And that's hard. That's not easy. There's no book that can just fix me. I can read the Bible over and over and it takes effort to get there. I think we all go through that. I know Paul did. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 2, it says, And though I understand all mysteries and all knowledge and have all faith, so i got to move mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. That's how it happens, you see. I get that stuff right, but I don't get this stuff right. And the love is not being shown. We've got to work on it. Paul experienced, his experience in Christ is his teaching. You understand that, right? What Paul taught is what Paul experienced. And so Paul's experience in Christ is the pattern of grace. Okay? So that's what we want to look at today. We want to look at eight patterns of grace and Paul and his pattern of grace from our passage in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Begin with me. If you want to turn in your Bibles, great. But the verse is in front of you there. We need to behold the pattern of grace for ministry. It says in verse 12, this is Paul speaking about himself. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful. That doesn't mean he was faithful. That doesn't mean he was faithful. He counted me faithful. Do you remember how it was accounted to Abraham as righteousness? He counted me faithful putting me into the ministry. Here's the truth, and you listen to this carefully. Grace is expressed in every preacher there is because none of us deserve to be preachers, especially me. You hear a preacher that acts like he deserves to go to heaven? He's unfaithful to God. Anybody who would get here and say, you deserve heaven, you're a liar. And you deserve to be a preacher, you're a liar. 
I don't care how many degrees you got behind your name. You can have the alphabet behind your name. And you're still unworthy of being a preacher of the gospel of Christ. Because it's of grace. And Paul admitted it. And then, he counted me faithful, but notice the next thing. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, that didn't have anything to do with that. But I obtained mercy because I did it in ignorance. You see, you need to understand that the pattern that Paul saw was a pattern of grace for the adversary. What? That's right. God has grace toward the people who hate us. Do you understand that? The people who get on TV and talk bad about us. The Muslims that hate Christianity. The atheists who think we're knuckleheads. God has grace toward them. If he didn't, they'd be gone. He'd have no time for them. They're gone. God has grace. And he obtained grace because that's God. <laughs> it's grace to the enemy. And since I was an enemy, by the way, and I want you to know how bad we were, we made fun of you churchgoers in my family. We thought you were all, I don't think you can say the word stupid in church. Can you say that in church? I don't think so. So that wasn't the word I used. But that's what we thought. That's what we thought. We thought you were dim-witted. That was the way I was raised. Okay? We laughed at the programs on TV. Thought it was funny. We were the enemy. I was the enemy. Paul was the enemy. If you were living against God, you were the enemy. Guess what? That's all of us. Number three. Behold the pattern of grace for the ignorant. He says, oh, I was all those things, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly. I mean, God extends grace to ignorant people that don't know this truth? Absolutely. No one will be saved if it's, you have to know it before you know it. <laughs> how can you know it before you know it? And if God takes it out on you before you know it, how would you ever get to know it? So absolutely, God is gracious toward those who are ignorant of it. There's grace before you're taught. Every last person on this earth is extended grace from God before they are taught. What grace? What are you talking about? Well, for one thing, the grace of life. You don't deserve that, did you? Did you deserve the grace of health? You didn't deserve that, did you? The grace of a brain? You didn't deserve that, did you? The grace of a Bible printed that you didn't have to do anything to get it here. What'd you, have to, what'd you do to get the Bible in your lap? Buy it? Woo. Got it on your little phone? You didn't do anything. God extended grace to you long before you believed. You were ignorant. We all were. And God's grace extended to us. Behold the pattern of grace for the unbelieving. Paul didn't believe. Paul didn't believe Jesus Christ was the Son of God. If he had believed he was the Son of God, you think he would have given his hand to help stone Stephen? He didn't believe he's the Son of God. So if you didn't believe, you're in good company. At some point, none of us believe. We were called children. Children don't believe. They just, whatever you say, that's it. That ain't belief. That's like... Everything's magic to them. You flip the switch, they think you turned the light on right there. That's what did it. It's just a switch right there. They don't know anything about the power company. They don't know those turbines that are running right now. They don't know nothing about that. They don't understand alternating current. They think the switch does it. They think you get money out of an ATM and you just get as much as you want. They don't understand that you run out of money. They think you can buy anything in the store if you want to. And you need ice cream every day. They don't know. They're, they're unbelievers. I mean, you say, well, oh, my kid believes. They don't believe like you believe. It's like a fantasy to them. 
You believe. And it's a struggle sometimes, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it was a struggle to Paul to say that Jesus was the Son of God and the risen Son of God. But you know, when you see Him, <laughs> kind of changes things, right? It changed things for him. He became a believer. But God had to lead him to Christ. Then, behold the pattern of grace from Paul for the conversion. In 1 Timothy 1, verse 14, it says, But the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which are in Christ. So once he was in Christ, once he was baptized, what happened to Paul? He grew in faith and in love. If you haven't, you may not be converted. That is conversion and that is grace. Because I wasn't very loving. And I certainly wasn't full of much faith. But the fact that God has led us along to have more faith and more grace and more love, that is grace. And that is Paul's experience. So it takes time, doesn't it? Haven't you noticed? It takes time. You know, I believe that's one of the reasons God gave us marriage so we could learn how unloving we really are and how self-willed we really are. Because you know that your mate is just obstinate. It's not you. And you know they're the ones that's not as loving as you are. Yeah, right. Takes time, doesn't it? And then Paul realized, and he's teaching the pattern of grace for who? The worst. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. That means basically we all accept that it's true for Paul, but it also means you all to all accept that it's true for you. That Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners. That's just part of it. Of whom I am chief. Well, Rex, you don't really believe that about yourself. Actually, I do. And I would encourage you to believe the same about yourself. Why would I think it? Because I'm standing in front of people telling them how they ought to live, and I ain't living it completely. Do you not know that, you know, uh, Eli had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas? You know this story? And Eli said to his sons, you're priests of God. And if you go against God, what's going to be the outcome of you? Have you ever read James chapter 3 and verse 1? Don't be many of you teachers, because you receive the more severe judgment. You want to tell people how they ought to live their life, and then you do wrong? I'm in far more jeopardy than anybody else in this room. So don't tell me I don't know anything about being the chief of sinners. And you ought to look in the mirror and do the same thing, because this is worthy of all acceptance. But here's what's great. Paul killed Christians, imprisoned Christians, and God extended grace to him long before his baptism. That's the grace of God. That's the grace of God. It's the pattern for us. And then, behold the pattern of grace for the prospect. And that's what he's really saying he's, he is, verse 16. However, for this reason, I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all the long-suffering. I'm in the example. I am the test case. I'm it, guys. Take a long look at what God did with me as a pattern to those who are going to believe on Him for everlasting life. They're going to believe, and they're going to believe they can be saved because if God can save me, Paul's saying, He can save you. Amen? Amen? If God can save a man trying to eliminate Christianity without him even making the turn toward it, he can save you. He can reach you. He can touch you. Grace is shown to the prospect. Listen to me. You, you may not believe it if you're sitting there and you're not a Christian this morning. You need to understand you are wanted. You are precious. And you are the love of his heart. And the old rugged cross was for you. Paul didn't know that. 
but it is true. And it's true for you and me. Finally, behold the pattern of grace for the worship that we engage in. You see, if you don't understand grace, you can come to church all the time. There won't be a tear flow out of your eyes. You won't walk away affected or anything. It's just like water off a duck's back. You'll, you'll float fine. But I'm going to tell you something. Once you get a little grasp of what we're talking about this morning, it'll change the way you worship. You'll want to be on your knees. Listen to what he says. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 Grace feeds our heart. It feeds our heart to the point we want to serve him. Grace feeds our heart to the point we want to worship him. Not just now. I want to worship him tomorrow and the next day and a thousand years from now and a billion years from now. I want to be on my knees praising the God who would dare reach down into the little boy's life in Alabama and care for someone like us. Absolutely. For the rest because you see once you get grace that's what's called true worship and it's the true worshipers if you don't understand it you're going through a ritual and that's about it that's the lesson today that's who grace displays itself to and how it changes us John Newton was born in London in 1725 that's a while ago he was the only child of a sea captain. And he was, his mother was a church girl and a woman, took him to church, made him read his Bible, go to services, but she died when he was seven. That's all he ever knew at church, didn't go. His stepmother was not a church goer, didn't care for it, his dad didn't either. So he, as he grew up, got in a lot of trouble. Got in trouble with the law, got in trouble in the streets, hurt people. And then when he turned about 19, he fell in love with Mary. Now, he didn't marry Mary, but he loved that girl. And he'd go see Mary, and one time he was going to see Mary, and he fell victim to what's called a press gang. You know what that is? You're not British, you didn't live back then. Press gang is when a gang of men grab you and force you onto a ship, and now you're in the Navy now. And that's the way it worked. That's how they got them, forced labor. The discipline on that ship was harsh. The food was bad and scarce. He nearly starved to death. He hated every minute of it. It nearly broke him as a young man. And so he tried to escape, but he failed. And so the captain took him, stripped his shirt off, and flogged him. Bore scars on his back the rest of his life for it. He transferred to another ship. Slowly over the process of time, he got involved in the brutal 18th century slave trade, and it was horrific. Let me give you just a little picture. You see that picture on the other side? That's what a slave trade ship looked like. That's where you put the slaves. They were in two levels of the ship, and they were stacked, and they were literally chained next to each other. Look how many they would put on a ship. People died there regularly. They didn't take care of them. They had to make it the other side. But guess what? It, even though it's horrific, it was legal and it was lucrative. There was lots of money to be made. and He was making it. He became known for his wild conduct. He was not a nice man. He was almost drowned after falling off the ship during a party that was so wild and he was up on the bow of the ship mocking God and faith and fell in and nearly drowned. As far as God was concerned, he was as far from him as he could possibly get and couldn't care less. God apparently had some other ideas though. In 1748, he was on board a slave ship called the Greyhound. Apparently it was an old ship and it was falling apart. During a violent storm, he was convinced they were all going down. One of their crew members was swept over and died. And it looked like not only them, but all the slaves and everybody was going to drown that night. It was a long night. He fought everything. And although he didn't believe much of anything, he got so scared. 
Suddenly he leaned back a little bit. That maybe, maybe his mother was right. That maybe what she had taught him about how God loves to show mercy even to people who feel they're beyond redemption, maybe God would even hear him. And for the first time in a long time, he actually prayed that God would save them that night, keep them from going down. Next morning, ship still float, survived, still floated, survived. And that changed him. It didn't happen overnight, though. He was a rough guy. It was tough. Y'all know about that? Sometimes you curse and swear and it takes a little time. Sometimes you do bad things, it takes a little time. It took him a little time. But he began to change. He learned to pray. Found a friend who kind of believed, and they talked together. He gave up his role in the slave trade. He actually married Mary. He became a preacher of a small English church, and he started writing hymns. Y'all may know it. It is the number one hymn in Christianity. It has been recorded more times than any other song about Christianity or faith. It is considered the number one song that we sing. He became a preacher of a large church in London during that time, and he tried to help people all he can. He became active in the movement to abolish the British slave trade. Once he began to be changed, he realized how evil he had been. The Prime Minister of England appointed him a part of the same group with Wimberforce. You ever heard of Wimberforce? Wimberforce and John Newton. John Newton became a key witness to explain the horrors of the industry of slaving. He could tell it from the inside and out. His compelling testimony helped make slave trade and slavery illegal in Britain first and then throughout the world. Amazing grace. Now you know that story. Listen to the words now and you will understand them more. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Can God save a wretch? I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. You remember when that was on that boat? Through many dangers, you know what the dangers were now? Toils and snares I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. The Lord has promised good to me. How many times have you used these words for yourself? His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Yea, when the flesh and heart shall fail and mortal life shall cease, I shall possess within the veil a life of joy and peace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine. But God who called me here below will be forever mine. Sounds like what I want to believe. How about you? When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise. And when we first begun, Gravestone, you see it right there. He wrote that before he died. He had his own gravestone made. And it sits in the church where he preached when he died. It says, John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and a libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. You know what that sounds like to me? It sounds like Paul. That sounds to me like me. Of course, to receive his grace, we do it in a faith that obeys. Of course, to believe, we must confess and we must repent and we must be baptized. Of course, 
We are saved always and forever by his grace. Of course, we are always saved and forever by his grace, but we are never totally, fully, completely sanctified, transformed. We're always growing, and that's the grace of God as well. Of course, we realize finally that it was always him and always him alone that saved me. So will you receive the grace today? Will you believe? Will you repent? Will you confess and be baptized? Will you be saved and understand finally what amazing grace really is? How you can be saved. Come if you need to while we stand and while we sing.